conversation on Agile with Martin DuPont, Project Manager at IBM's Spark Technology Center. Today we're going to talk about Agile. I've been active for over 15 years in the world of project management, living in many places. I'm from Belgium originally. I lived in Great Britain for many years, also stayed for some time in Australia, got married and lived in the Midwest for a couple of years, and then recently moved here. I started getting more and more involved with the, the world of Agile. It started with uh, rapid application development. And um, a few years back, I was also, I worked for Yellow Freight, uh, one of the largest trucking companies in the USA, where I was employed as a PMO leader. And we were introducing uh, Agile. And I was helping to facilitate a transition from waterfall over to, to Scrum and to some of the other Agile techniques, such as Six Sigma. I was also previously um, involved at other places, such as H&R Block, where I was an Agile coach and I was involved with the implementation, um, the re-implementation of uh, Scrum and uh, various techniques to improve it. Because, let's face it, Agile is a continuous work of, of improvement. The question is usually that people say like, well, is the glass half full or is it half empty? And the most obvious conclusion is it's half empty. People from a corporate perspective would say like, no, there's opportunities there. The glass is half full. We can do something with it. But now Agile introduces a new way of looking at things. And I think this is essentially what it all summarizes. Let's relook at the situation that we currently have and find new opportunities that before we haven't explored yet. And the conclusion in this case is, the glass is refillable. And if you think about it, this introduces a very novel concept, and especially on how we can approach things and take it from here. Before I continue, I think it would be good for me to, to point out, when I was making this presentation, I was thinking like, well, you know, on the one hand, people need the theory, right? But at the same time, they need, they also need the practice and they need some practical recommendations. And so this presentation, um, tries to offer both. So we're going to start first with the theoretical perspective. Uh, just go over a couple of, you know, simple concepts, because if, if we miss that foundation, then, uh, then we're going to run into problems. So, and then later on, in the second half of the presentation, we're going to focus a lot more on the practical implementation, but also especially on some of the biggest difficulties that we experience and how to address these. Because after all, if we know in advance what prob problems are coming, we can better prepare ourselves and really make a difference. Now, the difference between the traditional method and the agile method is it's just a different angle. And but it makes a big difference. With the traditional method, ultimately, the business says, this is a scope, we want you to do it, and you figure out what is the time and what is the cost that is going to be done. And usually these get, get crunched, and it is very hard. But the thing is, with the way Agile does, they, they reverse the logic. And they say, well, this is the time that we have and the resources. Here are, here is our budget and our costs we can deliver this amount of items and our scope will be limited. And there's a great advantage here. The advantage is that there's no disappointment on anyone's part. The customers know what they, what they will be getting. The business knows what they will be getting. And in the end, once expectations have been set, everybody will be a lot more relaxed and a lot more able to focus rather than be exposed to making promises that they can't keep. Here's just a quick summary of what Agile is about. So Agile is a team-based alternative. It's all about the team in this case, to some of the traditional project management techniques that we're so accustomed to using. And I'm sure we've, we've seen it all, right? Big long planning for an entire year, um, scheduling out way in advance. We prefer to start executing earlier. Reason is because we plan less in advance. We deliver frequently, whereby we show the business, hey, here are the, our deliverables, and repeatedly evaluate our objectives, 
by these iterations and repeatedly confirm satisfaction. This particular video is just going to show you what the Agile Manifesto is about. And these four principles will help us on, on our way to further explain the concept. It was 2001 and a group of software visionaries gathered at a ski resort to share their experiences and figure out why so many software projects were failing. This wasn't just about documenting best practices. They knew the industry required a fundamental shift in values, and so the Agile Manifesto was born. A declaration of four bold value statements that became the basis of a new approach to software development and would change the industry forever. But what were those four values, and why should you care? Let's take a look. But first, it is important to point out that the Agile Manifesto ends by noting that all of the things mentioned are important, just that some things must be prioritized over others. Okay, here we go. Number one, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. This doesn't mean throw processes and tools out the window. It simply means that a good face-to-face -face chat should trump rigid workflows and impersonal forms of communication. Number two, working software over comprehensive documentation. Makes sense, right? But traditional software development often produced extensive documentation before a program was released for initial testing. Some documentation is good, but wouldn't it be better to have the program than a book describing it? Number three, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Sure, you'll want to start out with some initial guidelines, but instead of locking customers in a cage by defining the exact details of the project before it starts, teams and customers should collaborate to find the best solutions. And finally, number four, responding to change over following a plan. Nothing ever goes entirely according to plan. So instead of sticking with something that isn't working, it's much more effective to make adjustments as your situation changes. Following the values isn't always easy, but when you build them into your team's processes, customers notice, and the payoff is huge. Which of the Agile values do you think is the most important? Realizing that what was originally set can, in the course of time, change and requirements continually um, get reviewed. Another thing also is customer interaction. It's important that we keep the customer cent central to all this process, but in a traditional way of project management that, that had not always been accomplished, especially because the customer in advance says, this is a scope that I want to see realized, and often only after the project has been accomplished a year later, we interact with the customer and find out that the customer's needs have changed or that there has been a total disconnect and a misunderstanding. So first of all, it is customer focused. I just spoke about that. But flexibility here is central. We want to be agile in a true meaning of the word, okay? Because this is a rapidly changing world and it's more important than ever before. Now it's focused on improvement. I think this is a central concept with agile methodology. It's continually trying to rethink ourselves on how we can improve and make things more efficient and better. Now, full disclosure, I mentioned it earlier on, from the very start, we tell executive management and we tell our customers, listen, this is how much you will accomplish, give or take just, you know, a small margin of error, but at least they will know very clearly in advance what the expectation is. Then team culture. Previously, you could have huge projects and the projects would get so big that there was never a real team culture. Now, the thing is, slowly they started realizing that it's all about the team and culture really feeds improvement and quicker delivery. Then risks and issues. If we will revisit the process on a very frequent basis, like Agile does, it will enable us also to identify risks very quickly. I'm sure you've all had it before, whereby things continue for months and an end, and then suddenly someone raises the question, often the executive manager, uh, why has this not been done? And then there's a whole chain of commands for someone to figure out, well, there was a blocker or some, there was some type of roadblock, and we've never really addressed it. Frequent checkpoints. If we will stop our entire process every two or three weeks to reflect how it went, it's, it will provide us very important feedback, easier reporting as well. 
those frequent checkpoints make reporting a lot more accurate and is a lot more tangible for executive management and customers to understand what is going on. And finally, a roadmap. Very frequently, roadmaps need to be made. And I've seen it often that, well, we need to develop a roadmap, we don't really know what lies ahead, but we need to put something on paper, well, let's do it. Well, Agile has certain methodologies that will particularly help with outlining everything that is needed, and especially according to, um, especially according to the importance and the urgency of the requirement. And let's start first to talk a little bit about the process, okay? We want to focus here a little bit on the theory, and we will start with what Scrum is. Hi, this is me. My name is Hamid Chojai, and I've been involved with a number of software development projects over the years at a number of different companies. And I've come to recognize Scrum as one of the best agile development practices in use today. In this fast-paced video, I want to show you why Scrum is so great and how you can get started with Scrum in under 10 minutes. I'll cover all the core Scrum concepts, like product backlogs, team roles, sprints, burndown charts, and more. So get ready to be bombarded with information. Let's say this is the product we want to build. For this product, we get all kinds of feature requests from customers, executives, or even other team members. In Scrum, features are written from the perspective of the end user. Therefore, features are known as user stories. The collection of all these user stories is called the product backlog. Another way to think of the product backlog is to think of it as a wish list of all the things that would make this product great. Once we have our wish list or the product backlog, we need to start planning which specific user stories we're going to be putting into a particular release of our product. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's back up a bit. To build this product, we need to have one or more people in our team who are going to play a variety of roles. First, we need her. She plays the role of product owner and helps make sure the right features make it into the product backlog, representing the users and customers of the product. She helps set the direction of the product. Then we need this guy. He's the Scrum Master, and his job is to make sure the project is progressing smoothly and that every member of the team has the tools they need to get their job done. He sets up meetings, monitors the work being done, and facilitates release planning. He's a lot like a project manager, but that's such a boring title, so we'll call him a Scrum Master to imply he knows some jujitsu. And the rest of the team has similar roles to other development processes. These guys build the product, while these guys test it to make sure it works right. These guys use it and hopefully pay for it. And these guys, they generally get in the way, but it turns out you can't build many products without them. But let's get back to this, release planning. To plan and release, the team starts with this, the product backlog, and they identify the user stories they want to put into this release. These user stories then become part of the release backlog. The team then prioritizes the user stories and estimates the amount of work involved for each item. Sometimes larger user stories are broken down into smaller, more manageable chunks. The collection of all the estimates provides a rough idea of the total amount of work involved to complete the entire release. A quick side note about estimates. There are a lot of techniques for creating good estimates. Some prefer estimating in story points, where estimates are made relative to building a small component with a known level of difficulty. Unfortunately, story points don't answer the question of, when will my project ship? I've found that the best technique is to estimate work in hours, but to use some standards in how estimates are done. For example, things that take less than a day to complete will be estimated as one hour, two hours, four hours, or eight hours. Every item will fall into one of those buckets. There will be no three-hour estimates, for example. A three-hour item would fall into the four-hour bucket. Larger items will be estimated as two days, three days, five days, or 10 days. Again, all estimates in between will fall into the next larger bucket. Extremely large items are similarly estimated in months, one, two, three, or six months. But the reality is that such items will need to be broken down substantially before work actually begins. We'll come back to these estimates in just a minute. But for now, let's get back to this, the release backlog. With a prioritized set of user stories and the estimated amount of work at hand, we're now ready to plan out several sprints to get the work done. Sprints are short duration milestones that allow teams to tackle a manageable chunk of the project and get it to a ship ready state. Sprints generally range from a couple of days to as much as 30 days in length, depending on the product's release cycles. The shorter the release cycles, the shorter each sprint should be and you'll want to have at least two to as many as a dozen sprints in a given release. So at this point, we can take our release backlog and split it up into several of these, sprint backlogs. One of the most important things to remember about sprints is that the goal of each sprint is to get a subset of the release backlog to a ship-ready state. 
So at the end of each sprint, you should have a fully tested product with all the features of the sprint 100% complete. Since sprints are a very short but a realistic representation of part of the product, a late finish of the sprint is a great indicator that the project is not on schedule and something needs to be done. Therefore, it's extremely important to monitor the progress of each sprint with this, a burndown chart. The burndown chart is the number one reason for Scrum's popularity and one of the best project visibility tools to ensure a project is progressing smoothly. The burndown chart provides a day-by-day -day measure of the amount of work that remains in a given sprint or release. In this graph, you can see that the amount of work remaining bounces up and down from day to day, but is generally trending towards zero. Because historical information is provided in the burndown chart, it's easy to see if the team is on the right track. Using the burndown chart, the team can quickly calculate this, the slope of the graph, which is also called the burndown velocity. This is the average rate of productivity for each day. For example, a team's rate of productivity might be that on a typical day they finish approximately 50 hours of work. Knowing that, it's possible to calculate an estimated completion date for the sprint, or even for the entire release based on the amount of work remaining. What's great about the burndown chart is that we can compare our actual velocity and projected completion date to what the team needs to do in order to finish on time. This is perhaps the most useful piece of knowledge that any team member, product owner, or product executive can have about the project because knowing whether or not the project is on track early in the schedule can help teams make the proper adjustments necessary to get the project on track. The burndown chart provides empirical proof that the project is on track or if it's going to be late. So let's talk a little about where the data for this incredibly useful burndown chart comes from. As you recall, part of the release planning process was to create an estimate for each user story in the release backlog. The collection of these estimates for a given sprint represents the total amount of work that must be done to complete that sprint. As each team member goes through and makes progress on one or more of the user stories, they simply update the amount of time remaining for each of their own items. So the total amount of time remaining on the group of user stories that make up a sprint changes on a day-by-day -day basis, hopefully going downward until it hits zero when the sprint is complete. The burndown chart aggregates the remaining work data and shows it visually. It's brilliant because it communicates a massive amount of information in just a few seconds. And that brings us to this, the daily scrum. The Daily Scrum is an essential tool to having communication flow freely between team members. The idea is to have fast-paced, stand-up meetings where team members quickly list the work they have completed since the last meeting and any obstacles in their way. By meeting daily, it ensures the team is always in sync and any major issues are dealt with as soon as they are known. Finally, as each sprint comes to a finish, it's important to have a sprint retrospective meeting where the team can reflect on what went right and areas of improvement. After all, Scrum is a flexible, agile development method that needs constant improving and tweaking for every team. So there you have it, Scrum in under 10 minutes. You now know all the essential concepts to start implementing Scrum inside of your organization. But wait a second, what about tools to help you implement Scrum? Well, it just so happens that I've spent the last 10 years building such a tool, with a lot of help from these guys, a group of genius coders and design ninjas. The tool is called OnTime, and it helps you manage your products, your backlogs, your team, your releases, and your sprints. It gives you project visibility with burndown charts and always answers the question of who is working on what. You can get started with it for free at Axosoft.com. Of course, you could use a giant whiteboard, some note cards, and a bunch of different spreadsheets to track everything. You could also use an abacus instead of a calculator to do math, but we're getting a little off topic. So let's quickly review everything. In Scrum, you work with this, a product backlog which is nothing more than a list of features that we call user stories. You then break down the product backlog into one or more release backlogs. And for a given release, you further break up the release backlog into a number of sprint backlogs, which are essentially short duration milestones throughout your project. You then monitor the progress of each sprint using these, burndown charts, and have daily scrum meetings to ensure everything is on track. After each sprint, you have a retrospective meeting to fine tune everything. And if you want a tool to implement Scrum, you can use OnTime. It'll help you ship software on time. That's all there is to it. Oh, and one last thing. Whether you loved or hated this video, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me on Twitter or via email if you have any feedback. Now, get going, create a great team, collaborate, and ship software on time. As I explained in the video, there are different roles. We have the users and the stakeholders. In a certain way, they are the outside group because they don't belong to the essential scrum team. Okay? But they are very important for us. The users or the, the customers, whoever it is, will really help, will determine what we will be doing. However, 
It is very difficult for us to interact with each one of those and it would delay uh, things considerably. That's why we have a specialized person whose name is the product owner. The product owner is the link between the outside world or upper management and their needs versus the team. He translates everything and he prioritizes and shows the importance and the, the importance of certain elements and how quickly they need to be accomplished. There's also the scrum master. The scrum master is the team leader. He is not a project manager in the strict sense of the word, but he fulfills a very similar role. He feeds the team the necessary information, he helps the coordination and he helps to to put together the reports so everybody stays on track. But he also helps the team to focus. For example, with a, just an example here, with the daily stand-ups, sometimes people take forever to finish the meeting and they keep talking about all kinds of things. Well, there the, the Scrum Master has a responsibility to keep everybody disciplined and stick to the 15 minutes because it should not take any longer than that. And finally, there's the team members. Of course, the team members make the essential part of the team. So just to recap, the Agile team consists of the team members, the Scrum Master, and the product owner. Very often, the product owner is not present at every single meeting, although that would be the ideal thing, but the Scrum Master and the team members interact very, very closely. Just a quick slide on the product owner. So he maximizes the value of the product or the service that we need to deliver. And he also manages what we call the product backlog. We will be looking at this in a couple of slides. This is really what all the customer needs are about. And finally, he represents the desire of stakeholders. Then we also have the Scrum Master. Very important here is the word servant leader. Okay, servant leader means many things. On the one hand, he needs to be a servant to the team. He needs to support them in any way he can, but at the same time, he needs to be a leader in the sense that he should be courageous. He should be able to stand up, for example, with the, the daily scrum meeting. If, for example, someone talks too much outside of the topic or, or people start having a large discussion, which uh, is not relevant, he should be able to stand up. But he should also encourage people to, to continue with, with the refable tend to examine themselves. Okay, the process cycle. This is a large overview here, a rough draft of the Scrum Sprint. So first of all, as we said, here's the vision. The general vision that we get from the customers together with, with executive management. On the basis of this, we are going to make a product backlog. As you see, the different items are split up. So there's a rough idea of which specific requirements we have that we need to fulfill. The product owner and the scrum master will, will select a portion of this and we will make a sprint backlog. And the sprint backlog is really the items that the team will be addressing in the next sprint. A sprint can be two to three weeks, sometimes four weeks, but usually it's better to keep it small, such as two weeks. Then here's the sprint. So here we see one to four weeks, as I just mentioned, but also 24 hours, because the daily standard meetings evaluate on a daily basis where we are at. And finally, you see here that we have the sprint review and retrospective. After those two weeks, we're going to evaluate what have we done? Have we accomplished what we needed to do? What risks and issues are still out there? And what can we improve? And this is a very important element that has actually not been implemented so far with traditional project management. Let's talk a little bit about the backlog. First of all, we have the product backlog. Secondly, we have the sprint backlog. And then we have grooming sessions to refine the product backlog and keep it up to date. So of the entire cycle, we will be talking about these two elements here. So the product backlog is, is the high level features. There are the estimates and the priorities. And so the product owner gets these from the customer. The product backlog is mainly the tool of the product owner. The scrum master will be there to assist him, but essentially the product owner is the independent owner. And that's the only part that he truly owns by himself. Then the sprint backlog is actually the next step. As we said before, we take the small chunk of the product backlog, namely the most important items that need to be addressed, 
And we're going to get very specific on what we need to do. We will split it up in user stories and tasks. So here you see the product backlog. And over there you see the, the user stories and the use cases that we have with every single requirement. The product backlog is the property of the product owner and not of the team. It is very high level, scratching things on the surface but making clear what is needed. Then there's no tasks, so don't go into detail. It is highly changeable because in a month's time, the client could have very different requests or he could realize that, wait a minute, even though in the past we said that this was our highest priority and things can have shifted. Product backlog needs to be reprioritized on a very frequent basis. What is a grooming session? A grooming session is coming back to the product backlog two weeks and the product owner together with a scrum master and possibly with a subject matter expert will revisit it, will look at the new requirements or new desires of the customer and will re-evaluate things and perhaps come to new conclusions or new priorities. But essentially it, it is very important that we keep this up to date because this will be the basis for us to decide what we will work on. We have the sprint planning now. User stories, they're a tool in Agile to kind of describe what is needed from a customer perspective, okay? And they explain what exactly is needed. It's a much lower level kind of description than what we usually find back in a product backlog. Okay, and there's a fixed template, a fixed format that we actually use to compose those. As a, and then whatever your user role is, I want to do this or that, okay, so that, and then you point out the value. You can say to yourself like, well, why would I want to do this? I mean, why do my, do all the different team members need to compose one of these user stories? Well, there's different team, there's different team members and they have different roles to play. And sometimes one person can look at things from one perspective while someone else can do from a totally different perspective. We need all to be on the same page because what is the point of everybody finally making something or delivering something? Well, there was a misunderstanding from the very beginning. And because it is so specific, it will help us to avoid these misunderstandings. And I wanted to illustrate this with this little cartoon here. How the customer explained it and what the customer really wanted. I know that previously there's always business cases being written and so on. But in this case, it is just very important that all the team members are, have a full comprehension of what is needed. Now, what are epics? Sometimes requirements from, from the customer or from the business are huge. And sometimes there's different elements that are interconnected, but at the end of the day, they all form a bigger entity. Well, those bigger entities we call epics. And very often in the backlog, what we will find is multiple of these big chunks. Okay, now if we're dealing with big chunks, if we're dealing with epics, ideally we should be splitting them up in smaller user stories. Sometimes it tends to be hard, but we really should do an effort to make it as tangible as possible. Before I continue here, see, I also want to point out that with the user stories, the user stories end up being split up in separate tasks before the sprint kicks off. And this is a very important element. It is not just sufficient to explain uh, to the team members, this is what needs to be done, we need to identify which tasks there are so the team members can then, according to their availability, determine I can take care of this task and you can take care of that task and work simultaneously. Sprints. What are sprints? And let's talk a little bit about daily standard meetings and especially let's talk about blockers. So previously, we spoke about the product backlog and a sprint backlog. The previous chapter, we also spoke about the sprint planning. So now the next step is the actual sprint. Sprints are these fixed length iterations. I suggested two weeks, but three weeks or four weeks or even one week would work, but they will always remain the same. It's a cadence and we don't want to fall outside of that cadence. So we can really, so the business and the customer know exactly what to expect. And so, as you see here, there's a sprint backlog, okay, 
and then all these different elements, so the blue refers to the user story, all these things will go into, will be worked upon, and so on. Daily standard meetings, what it comes down to is the following. Every day the team meets, and every day the team tells each other what they worked on the previous day, what they will be working on this day, and thirdly, they will point out what problems are they facing. And it's not necessarily the problems, it's more explaining why there could be a delay. So we are able to anticipate it well in advance, but most importantly, the Scrum Master can jump in and actually help out, try to remove those blockers or roadblocks or whatever you want to call it. So the daily standard meetings, three little characters, exactly answering those three questions. This is what I have done since we last met the day before. Here are the obstacles that I've been encountering. By the way, there don't always have to be obstacles. It is quite possible that someone has nothing and then he just says, I have no blockers. And then finally, this is what I plan to do today. So here are a couple of examples of blockers. For some reason or another, people seem to have a real hard time at daily stand-ups to identify what blockers are. There might be different reasons for this. First of all, they might not think it's that important, or they can think like, hey, I'll, uh, I'll figure it out very soon, and there's no need to notify the team, and so on. Or maybe they're afraid that they, they will be blamed for, for something going wrong. But here's at least some examples so that you, when you implement the daily, the daily stand-up meetings, at least understand and can encourage your team members, here is really what we're looking for, and please help us identify it. Um, for example, I still have not got, gotten the software that I ordered a month ago. Here, for example, in this case, the Scrum Master can, can come to the assistance of the person and he can make the necessary steps to speed things up. The department VP has asked me to work on something else for a day or two. We get these type of requests on a very frequent basis, where it's a manager, maybe even another team, who quickly asks for our assistance. But they are essentially real blockers because they will affect our workflow. And, and the Scrum Master, he can then help determine whether we have the, the luxury to dedicate our time on this or not. Or he could, for example, negotiate and talk to the other team and see if there would not be a, a solution to go around it without using the team's capacity. Alrighty, reviews. Let's talk a little bit about their sprint review meetings and the retrospectives. So, we spoke before about the different types of backlog, then those backlogs are being worked through sprint planning, we have everything concise together, we know what we're going to work on, then we actually take a couple of weeks to specifically work on it, and when, when those weeks are over and the sprint has come to an end, the question remains, how will we improve things? Where are we at with things? So first of all, we have the sprint review meetings. Even though teams, having worked for a couple of weeks on their sprint, really have something to show for, frequently teams tend to forget about these. And it's a very strange phenomenon because at the same time, you would expect the Scrum Master or the team leader you know, to, to be able to tell the team, listen guys, here are all the items that we've accomplished. And there might be a couple of things still outstanding, but it's a great encouragement for the team to see how far they have gotten. The Scrum review meetings, they really unify the team as a whole. It is not merely a question of uh, reporting where we are at with, with the things. It is also nice to look back. Before I forget it, the sprint review meeting is also a meeting where we particularly want to involve the product owner and possibly even the client. If the client gets involved with these sprint review meetings, then the client will, first of all, firmly start understanding that there is a fixed process being followed, that we have things under control, that things have been delivered. There's no point for us to wait for two months and then to get back to the customer and the customer suddenly to realize whoa, we are so far behind, or this or that. No, if we have a frequent meeting with the customer, the customer will understand that there might have been certain risks or issues or complications, and he will better understand, and he might even help us to reprioritize things. Now, retrospectives. I have to say, of all the different things, the different elements that Agile offers, 
I feel that retrospectives have helped the teams the most. People are sometimes frustrated or sometimes things just don't go well and they feel like screaming and they don't have an opportunity to do so. Well, with the retrospectives, well, I can assure you nobody screams, but with the retrospectives, we, we let everybody speak, speak out, and we can address what went well, but we can also address what we think could, could be improved upon, and we can kind of reevaluate. And it has been an extremely, extremely helpful tool to Agile and as a whole. Alrighty, delivery. Now maybe here's the, the part where it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's nothing to be afraid of. It is more the type of metrics that we use to me measure our success and how far we have gone. So just a qu recap very quickly. Went over the product backlog, looked at the sprint planning, and then we worked on things. We reviewed our work and saw how far we've, we have gotten. And now we're going to look at the deliverables. Story points. As the video very, very well explains, we need to somehow or another be able to estimate the work that we are doing. The video recommended using hours. They found that very successful. Other teams have used story points and so on. But whatever it is, we want to have some type of tangible number that we at least we can follow and understand where are the bigger chunks of work and where are the smaller ones? And this is exactly what, what we're talking about. As you can see with, with these stones, something that is very small, the team can just, you know, address this very quickly and it will not be a problem. And it is not something that has one point or, you know, or is, that is very small that will prove to be an obstacle. However, if the team starts working and they, they don't address the large stone, the 5.1, well, down the line, that could prove to be problematic because you don't necessarily want to leave the biggest chunk at the very end. And here's also the burn down chart, okay? The video also did a, did a great job in explaining that. But the burn down chart tries to measure how much work we've accomplished and so on and how, how much work remains. The interesting thing here is, for example, is here, I don't know if you can see the red dot, but the graph goes slightly up over there. And then the reason is the following. It is possible that at the last minute something comes up and some extra workload was given and there was a, a, a small readjustment of what we we're doing. So I thought of just explaining that because, you know, it is good for us to completely understand what is involved. Okay, let's recap the whole deal. So we have the, the vision, the vision that the customer tells the business there's a business case being made. And the product backlog will split up the, the, the entire business case in smaller portions and then we reprioritize them. Then the sprint backlog, we take a small chunk of that of those requirements. Then we work on the sprint for a couple of weeks and whereby we have daily meetings and review daily where we are at with things. And then finally we deliver we deliver the product or deliver, deliver the service or whatever it is and we also make sure that um, at the very end is as it were the, our little break we review things and see how, how it all went and then we restart the entire process that was a theoretical part let's start talking a little bit more about about the practice first of all when you talk about problems Businesses have problems. Every company has difficulties and it's not necessarily that's our own fault, but frequently we don't take the time to reevaluate where, uh, where the problem could be and what type of solution that we could find. And Agile, because don't forget, Agile is more than just Scrum. Agile is a variety of, of different methodologies and they, and different tools have provided different solutions. One of the big Agile um, companies from the very start has been Toyota and, and the companies in Japan, whereby they try to be very creative with finding new solutions. This is something that I, I strongly recommend to all the business units or divisions, is to do a root cause analysis of the situation and difficulties that, that they are facing. Now, Toyota came up with a template. It's called the A3 template, and it provides a root cause analysis to figure out where are things going wrong, what are the real causes that are causing this, let's come up with a solution for each of those problems, and finally, 
let's make a quick projection of when we're going to implement these changes. And this is particularly important because if we want to introduce Agile to, to a company or to a division or a department, we need to at least take a step back and, and briefly reflect upon where we are with things, where we are at with things. So, I don't want to spend too much time on this, and I think it would be a great thing for you, for you guys to look up. But let's just at least have a, have a closer look at things and understand what really is involved with this, how this, how this root cause analysis works. One of the big things that stands out here is the process. Processes can be very complicated, but what you want to do here is you want to give a concise understanding of the workflow, the process flow of the situation. Now, I've also here put some of these uh, explosion symbols, okay, and what they actually try to indicate, they indicate where problems occur. We're aware that problems don't occur there or they don't occur there, we know main problems take place here. So now we can start focusing on a real analysis of the, the situation, what's triggering that, that, those issues. And so this diagram is called the Ishikawa or fishbone diagram. In this case, the problem or the problems that a company was having was split up over six different issues. Namely, some of them were related to actual the scrum, the others were actually related to the standard meetings that were not going as good as it could. Others were about validating data because the, there was a huge time lag. Then here about the requirements, maybe there was ambiguity about what exactly needed to be delivered. Then the meetings, meetings were, for example, taking too long or meetings were, um, there were not enough meetings. There could be different problems. And finally, planning. And so in every single category, then these get split up in subcategories, whereby, for example, and this is very applicable here to this Agile course, for example, stand-ups. So the, the problem here is visualization and attention. On the one hand, stand-ups, if there's no visualization being offered, it is very hard for people to stay focused. They have nothing to look at. You can report as much as you want on progress. If you don't see it, the team will lose focus. And the other thing is attention. People don't always, during these daily standard meetings, give necessarily the attention that, it ought, that they ought to give. People might be sitting down or people might be behind their, their laptop typing an email while they're expected to, um, to participate. I wasn't sure whether I would, would show you this or not, but I personally, I like it, but I think it's more a philosophy that we should incorporate in ourselves. And some people have it naturally. For other people, it's sometimes very good to just see it. This is called the, the PDCA, the Plan, Do, Check, Act. And essentially, when we want to have continuous improvements, more in the sense of here are our outstanding items. Here are some items that we should address in the future. Then, then the do part, the act part is, okay, well, let's take some of these items that we're going to work on. Then the next thing is, once we've, we've executed on them, let's quickly check if they really get to the stage where they render the results. And then finally, the act part where everything is being rolled out and so on. And then after a while, you re-examine everything and, and the act part becomes, becomes part of the plan again because there might be certain corrections that need to be taking place. We address a certain issue, we try to find a solution, we check if the solution works, and let's roll with it. Storyboards. Storyboards are very important. Storyboards are the boards that we actually use to drive the team and to make them understand where we are with the progress. This is an example of a typical Scrum board. The difficulty with Scrum is that usually Scrum is used for development groups and it is not necessarily always applicable. Now with the development part, teams can very often work on certain tasks simultaneously. Someone can take a certain item and say, I will take care of this. And another person will say like, hey, this is still outstanding, let me take care of that. And they can deliver pretty much at the same time, or at least there's a very little dependency. However, there's also a different methodology, which is called Kanban. And Kanban approaches things very differently. 
it is, it is very similar and it works with a similar board, but at the same time, it, it is a lot more geared towards sequential activities, whereby there's great dependencies between different groups and one person needs to wait for the previous person to accomplish it. I got a little video on Kanban that's briefly going to explain what it is. Hi, I'm Angelo Coppola with Axosoft. You've probably seen our video Scrum in under 10 minutes, which is the world's most popular video about the Scrum methodology. Many viewers have written us requesting that we talk about another software development system, Kanban. Kanban is a fantastic way to get things done, and it also works great in conjunction with Scrum, if that's the way you want to do it. A Kanban is a lean scheduling system developed in Japan by the Toyota Motor Corporation. A Kanban system utilizes visual cues that tell you what to produce, how much to produce, and when to produce it. A typical sushi menu like this is a great example of a Kanban. Customers indicate which items they would like to have right then and how many of each. It's simple and efficient, like these. Maybe this is why your favorite sushi restaurant always seems to get your order right. When adapted to software development, Kanban systems usually start with a board and visual cards that represent items in your product backlog. On the board, you place the cards into columns that represent their current step in the workflow, ranging from new to complete. The steps in between are entirely up to you, so keep it simple and efficient. The visual nature of the board makes it easy to find out what's already been done, what's in progress, and what's going to be started next. So long as your team keeps finishing work, those cards keep moving to the right like this, and most importantly, you keep delivering features to your customers. To help ensure items are being completed at a steady pace, Kanban imposes limits on the number of items that can live in any one workflow step at any given time. These are called work in progress, or WIP limits. They should be set so that the work flows as smoothly and consistently as possible. If your team runs into a problem, these limits will bring it to light very quickly by creating a visible bottleneck. This allows the entire team to swarm on the problem, and that's just another way of saying collaborate. Limiting the amount of work that's in progress means that you've got to finish some of the things on your plate before you can start on additional items. WIP limits help you keep work flowing, save time by eliminating too much task switching, and complete tasks. Kanban is fantastic in its own right and on many projects may be all that you need, but I found that when paired with a good Scrum framework and a great Scrum tool, Kanban really shines. Scrum provides the structure for organizing feedback, short-term planning, stack ranking, an inspect and adapt mindset, and other organizational improvements, while Kanban provides a steady flow of tasks that reach 100% completion by helping your team manage day-to-day -day development with a minimum of overhead and blocking issues. So there you have it, Kanban for software development. You can get started on Kanban and Scrum with a free 30-day trial of on-time Scrum. It is a feature-packed, blazingly fast way to manage your software projects. With OnTime Scrum, you can visualize your product backlog as cards and rank their importance. You can also organize items by developer. Imagine the peace of mind you'll get from this view of your project, knowing who's working on what and when it will be done. Not only that, but with customizable dashboards, you can see burndown charts, graphs, and projected ship dates. This kind of project visibility inspires confidence. The overview that I gave uh, there were different phases in the sense that it could be in progress, then something needed to be tested and so on, and it can take, it can go step by step. But the second very interesting element is these whips. The work, what is the work in progress limit, whereby we determine that someone can only work on X amount of items at the same time. And then that way people don't get overloaded, because ultimately, if we work on a hundred things at the same time, then nothing will get accomplished and everybody will be frustrated. But here is, for example, how a Kanban board would look like at its very start. Nice and simple, okay, very clean and so on. Once we start with it and so on, the Scrum board or the Kanban board, whatever you want to call it, will actually start becoming a live entity whereby it's a real work in progress. From my own experience, I found that these boards are a tremendous help, okay? And I, I realize that the difficulty for teams who that are not co-locating and are dispersed, that they don't always have the availability of having an actual physical board.
Now, of course, there are online tools that allow this, but a physical board will allow you to be also a lot more creative and a lot more efficient. And in my previous projects, um, some of the items that I've used, I've created my own symbols to help the team better to stay focused. The colors that up there are the different colors of post-its that I was using. And so it, I did them according to team. And these little symbols indicate that something is in progress and it might, it might be an item that is going to take a long time. Let's say, for example, something that needs to be worked on for, let's say, five, six days. Well, it is important for us in, in advance to identify this is going to be a, a long effort. Anyway, then blockers. Now, when someone mentions with a certain task, I'm, I'm having a blocker. For example, the software that I ordered was not delivered, I can't continue, and so on. Now, the thing is, as soon as an item has a delay, a possible delay of more than 24 hours, we need to call it out. And that's why right next to the task, we, we can add a little, little symbol, a little stop symbol, whereby the team every single day will be reminded, whoa, wait a minute, the process is being held up and we need to address this issue. Also, potential risk. We, so very often, we can already see in advance something coming up that will become a blocker at some point, and we want to flag that. The little stars I use because I want to make sure that all my team members are very driven towards meeting a certain date of delivery. And so I would ask the team members, okay, you mentioned this, when do you expect this task to be finished? And there's no pressure on a team member, but just give me an understanding, when do you think this will be finished? And if he says like, well, in two days time, well, great, I take a pen and I write on the yellow star this date. And then in two days time during that meeting, the next daily standard meeting, I can talk to the team member and say like, well, where were you at with that? Were you able to deliver that or not? However, let's say, for example, it comes out that the date that he originally set was not realistic. We can just mark out the original date and put a new date on there. But the great advantage that this technique has is that if this date ends up being postponed again and postponed again, this little star will become full of scribble and will draw the attention that something seriously is wrong and needs to be addressed. And the, the great advantage is also with, with the due date is that sometimes there's so many tasks involved that we just keep losing, that we lose track over it. And the Scrum Master definitely needs to make sure that we follow up with every outstanding item. I made a little green star because sometimes we're working on something and it's not always clear what exactly is needed. The green star identifies that we need to talk to the product owner or to the customer and see what exactly is wanted. And finally, a little arrow, a blue arrow, because if there's a dependency between team members, the other team member needs to know when something was finished. People don't always send an email, or if they do, then sometimes you have a hard time catching up with the email and, and figuring, figuring out that something has been, has been completed and is now waiting for me to finish it off. Okay? Well, the blue arrow definitely solved that problem. Now, you might think, during the daily stand-up meetings, the other team member would be there and he would know. Well, that's very true, but we're all human. Sometimes people come late or sometimes people are sick or they are, at, they are at a conference or whatever it is. And so when they come back, let's say the next day, and they will look at the board, they will see the blue arrow and they will, they will be notified and they will realize, hey, wait a minute, this item is not, has been moved up and is now in my queue. Well, let's go back to the original chart. Once again, the picture is a little bit dark. Right here, first of all, we mentioned the number of sprints that we're at. So in this case, this was a whole new project. It's sprint one. But also, let's make sure that we have a little piece of paper where every day the number of days that are left are on. Because that way the, the team especially stays focused on how many days they have left to finish the work. This is particularly valuable if sprints will be, will, be, will be very long. Let's say we're dealing with a sprint of four weeks. Well, it is very, very easy to lose track and suddenly to realize three days beforehand that the sprint is over. But if we keep track over how many days are left, 
we can start every daily scrum meeting by saying, hey guys, this is how many days we have left. This is how many days we've already worked. Where are we at with things? This was a, a case of very strong dependencies between, between different team members, okay? Every column has been split up in two columns, whereby the first part of the column is actually the work in progress, and the second column is that the item has been completed. In practice, people tend to move over an item to someone else's, to someone else's queue, and it was not always 100% clear whether it was completed. Because we want to definitely make the distinction between an item could be completed, but it is not, but it's not necessarily in progress while the other one means we're actively working on it. And with the Kanban methodology, we only want to work on X amount of things. So it's very possible that there will be several items that have been completed and waiting for you to work on before they can actually be worked on because of the workload. Right on the top of the picture, there's a clock. Daily stand-up meetings have the terrible problem of getting longer than they need to. And it's important that we stick to 15 minutes. There's no excuse. The, the, daily, the daily meetings should go, should go very smoothly. And so putting a clock above the scrum board, everybody is looking at the scrum board. And if necessary, the scrum master can jump in and say like, hey, come on, guys, let's, let's keep moving forward here. Let's keep moving on. Okay. Alrighty, grooming sessions. So what is a grooming session again? A grooming session is one of those sessions whereby the product owner looks at the outstanding items that need to be delivered for the customer, okay? And he needs to reevaluate and reprioritize them. This is a methodology that has proven to be one of the most successful in my experience, and it's called Moscow. It's must, should, could, and would, or would not, okay? Well, let's quickly explain what it is about. Well, it consists out of three different steps. First of all, we're going to write down all the different requirements, okay? Everything that is needed for the business. To classify those requirements, namely the must, the most important category, we must deliver it, okay? The should is, it, we need to do it, but it doesn't have the highest priority. Then the could is like, these are great things. These will really bring value to the customer. It's a little bit down on, on the burner. And finally, there's the would or rather would not. If there's anything that we do not need to do, it will be in this category. Now, we will try to accomplish it, but if anything happens, this is the least important uh, for us to worry about. And then finally, once those we've placed all those requirements in the different categories, then we finally are also going to categorize them in, in order of importance. Because there could be 20 uh, requirements that are absolutely essential and need to be done. But within those 20, within those 20, we can still make a priority and say like, this needs to be addressed next week, while this one could be, could wait for, uh, for three weeks. I truly believe that this methodology will not only help the customer, it will not only help executive management, but it will especially help the team because you do not want the team to work on things that are not worthwhile for them to work on. And then afterwards, they find out that the customer is furious because you've been working on the wrong thing. So in this case, if someone wishes to start an eBay service company, this online tool will specialize in the sale of tickets. And here are the requirements. So, we have this very simple business case here. So, how are we going to look at this? Let's write everything down on little post-its. Let's put one big pile and make sure we have everything, we have captured everything. Let's put all these things in different categories. But let's just now presume that the customer was very specific or the product owner really understood where the priorities lie. And in this case, for example, with the languages, I put English as a must. Having a secondary language could be very desirable, but could not be the highest priority. And then the other musts are different account types, namely an admin, a buyer account, a seller account. The easiest solution for them to work from is to provide a fixed sales price, right? The auction element could be added afterwards later on, but it's less important. Now, for, And then, for example, in the should category, we find things like seller ratings. 
cellular ratings are very important, but they're not 100% essential. Now, they're extremely highly desirable, but the thing is that if we need to determine our work order, let's put that in the second column. Okay, the would or would not category, I put in there tracking. Postal tracking of, of the item that has been shipped off. It's a nice, desirable thing to have, but if we take everything into consideration, this item is not the highest on our priority. And let's say, for example, we were running out of time and we're unable to finish everything off that we should have. Well, tracking is definitely at, at the bottom of the burner. And then the third step is, as I mentioned before, now let's, within that group, within that category, prioritize according from high to low. And in this case, nothing can, can be started without creating the account types. If there's no possibility for even the buyer to, you know, to make himself a profile, we're not going to go anywhere. There needs to be an admin and so on. The product owner, together with the scrum master and possibly with some subject experts, can sit together and go over this and have an internal discussion where they think something should fall. The goal is that every two weeks, this will be revisited and we can relook at and change the priorities. Working with post-its is very handy because you don't have to rewrite everything out again. Right there and then, user can grab one post-it and swap it over in position if priorities have changed. This exercise, besides having identified priorities, have also done one other thing. They have identified for you a roadmap for the future. Because if we go to that list, and we go from the first column top to bottom, and we follow through, we have established ourselves a roadmap whereby we set out for ourselves goals on the short term and on the long term. And so I just put this picture in here. This was an example of a grooming session. And the reason why I want to point this out is because it is not your typical meeting. It is not your typical team meeting. The number of participants is usually smaller because there's not necessarily a need for every team member to be involved because these things are very high level and they keep changing anyway, right? So essentially, it's all, it's all about the customer and who interacts with the customer and possibly bringing in certain experts who, who might advise us on, wait a minute, this item could be less important but it is very complex and we need to address it sooner than later. Sprint planning. Now here's a couple of techniques um, how we can actually get to concrete results and, and help us to understand and estimate things and so on. But remember that I was talking about story points, user story points. So one way to do it is, for example, we have this poker method. And it's a special card deck that has been designed for Agile. Everybody gets a deck. The Scrum Master presents the story, the user story that is up for discussion. And at the same time, everybody pulls out out of their deck a card. And it's the amount of user story points that they attribute to that specific task. So the lower zero, of course, means this has already been done. We don't have to worry about it. There's no work involved. Something like 13 means it's, you know, it's a job that needs to be taken care of. It will take us a couple of days. But something like, like 40 or 100, now that indicates that there's something important going on there and this could take us multiple sprints. If that's the case, then we need to reassess and see whether that bigger, uh, that bigger requirement or that bigger job could not be split up as smaller chunks. Every team member at the same time, exactly the same time, so they don't inf influence each other, pulls out their card, right? Now, what we will see is that pe different people have different values, right? The next step is that the two people with the two most extreme cards interact and the scrum master calls him out and says, well, why do you have four? Uh, why does he, why do you have 40? And then one team member can say to the other, as an example, well, that's a very easy job. That's a no brainer. But the other person can say like, what are you talking about? This is super complex. Have you thought about this and this and this, right? Or it could be the other way around. Someone thinks it's very complex and it has already been partially been done. But the thing is that after this confrontation and this dialogue, you have the team members re-vote again until you find a consensus on how much work really is involved. There's another technique that I frequently use 
And I find it very, very helpful because I'm stepping away from numbers and yet at the same time I'm using a consensus that everybody knows about, namely t-shirt sizes. Everybody knows what a small is and everybody knows what a large on Excel is, right? So the thing is that each time we go over a requirement or a user story, I ask the team, well, what size do you think this is? And someone will say medium or large or whatever. And it, and it comes down to the same thing. If one person says, well, this is a small task, and someone else says, no, no, this is a, an extra large, then you should you know, start a dialogue between the different team members and find out, well, what is the real story? Is the story more complex? And do we need to reevaluate things? Or do you guys are, is a team able to reach consensus on really how much work would, there will be involved? I would strongly focus on keeping it simple. There's no need to overcomplicate things. So let them rather think in terms of t-shirt sizes and how much work is left rather than, than the specific numbers. This is the t-shirt size. And here, that's the, the specific number that corresponds with it. Okay, a large is a 20, extra large is a 40. And you can calculate if these are the items that you plan to work on for the next sprint, okay, and these item, items have been identified, you can calculate and you come to the conclusion as a team progresses and it get more and more familiar what they are able to do within those couple of weeks. You also are going to develop a very strong sense of how many story points you're able to pull off. And once you have that, this is key because then you can take it to the next level. You can, the next time you start planning, tell the guys, hey, we need to keep it within reason. We have to be realistic. We can't take on too much or we can take on something extra because in the past it has proven that actually we're able to do better. Now those t-shirt sizes come in very handy and we can help determine now as well how big a chunks of work are these. And this will also help us to understand whereby we say, yeah, this is about one sprint. Our first two weeks, this is what we'll be able to accomplish. And the next two weeks, well, that's a small and an extra small. So those two are very small. So we'll probably be able to, you know, do something extra. So we can already maybe start addressing this, but we at least have the expectation because this is a, you know, it's a considerable size. It is very possible that we'll have to carry this over to the next sprint and we won't be finished it within on time. But at the same time, let's kick off with it and let's already start doing some, some work, the first work. The fist of five technique, it's, it's not for everybody, let me put it this way. But, you know, when you, when you interact, interact with the team and you want to find out how comfortable they are with um, taking on a certain, a certain task immediately or if you want to wait a little bit with it, then you would have every team member raise their hand at the same time, okay, and and five or four means that that they feel comfortable and a one or a two means that they're less comfortable. But the reason why we do this whole thing with the hands is the very simple reason that people are just not that talkative during meetings. There's always the same people who do the talking. The Delphi method is a different type of discussion, but this time you go one person after the other of the entire team, okay, and every person gives their opinion about it, and then once you've gone done the circle, then you do it for a second time so people can give some feedback about some of the other considerations that they heard. Retrospective. Just to recap here a little bit, how well have we done? And if you remember, I said that this has proven to be one of the most successful things to turn a team around because it enables them to, to address certain issues. And I can assure you, the best suggestions for process improvement and better delivery have been through this, I guarantee you. At one project that I worked on, implementing the retrospective ended up leading to an improvement of 40%. Because very often, someone has great suggestions on how to address certain issues, but they just don't speak out. The Scrum Master asks every person to speak out, one after the other, and nobody interrupts. You have two columns, and you ask, you ask the two questions. So what went well, and what do you think could be improved? And once you've written everything down of all the different team members, 
then you go over to the to the actions. By hearing both of these, you already figure out, and we we'll, should start doing that, but we can keep doing this. And here's a different type, you know, start, stop, keep, more or less. Sometimes people feel less comfortable, especially in the beginning, to start categorizing things and, and calling them out. So sometimes the, the great way to do is like, what did you think went well last time? And then everybody always wants to be positive or has something positive to contribute, right? Well, the next step is in the, you go over to what is less good. Okay, reporting. It is not because we're agile that we should neglect reporting. Our clients depend upon it, right? Executive management depends upon it and the team depends upon it as well because it will show their success and their goal-driven efforts, okay? Every good report must contain this. There are no excuses. Risks and issues. How many reports are not mentioning risks and issues? It leads to the aggravation of management that they are not being made aware of problems in advance. Frequently, management or clients understand that certain issues can, can, can develop and, and they're unstoppable. They realize this. The only thing they want to do is at least be told in advance so it can develop a risk or an issue mitigation plan. This is an example of a report that I made in the past and risks can be very small things, okay? A risk can, for example, be a vacation. What In the month of July or August or wherever the, your, your vacations or holidays most frequently place, if the entire team leaves and there's only 50% capacity left, well, that is a problem. Or if, for example, one of your subject matter experts uh, leaves for a three-week vacation, okay, now, that can really slow down the team, and these things need to be identified. And also, what I propose is with all the user stories and so on, it is very useful, especially to, to, to report to management and the clients, that we have milestones. We cannot move away from milestones. And here's just a quick overview, some of the things that we can put in there. You know, then we report and show the status of where we are with things. We, we can show a burndown chart. At the bottom is what we call a velocity chart. It shows the average work, you know, in story points that is being delivered on a weekly basis. Okay, best practice. Now, here's probably the, the best part of the whole presentation. Let's go over um, some concrete situations. So, sprint planning. So, here are some common traps with sprint planning. The story points prove to be a nightmare. So, let's simplify it. Let's try to keep things simple. And let's aim for something that the team feels comfortable talking about, right? Maybe they feel most comfortable talking about ours and, and expressing it that way. And huge epics. Remember I said that epics were these huge user stories that are a huge amount of work and will take multiple weeks, if not months. Well, let's try to break those up. And a carryover of user stories. There seems to be a frequent misunderstanding whereby people seem to think that a sprint needs to finish every single item that is in there. And that is not true. Sometimes it is unavoidable. Let's say, for example, you have a sprint of two weeks. There's no way on earth that you can complete that entire, an entire job within two, two weeks. We have to be realistic. But at least we need to make the team aware, wait a minute, we, we will be carrying over this task, but let's make sure next time we finish it off. So, perpetual user stories. Sometimes they keep going on and on and on and on and on, right? We have to make sure that user stories come to completion. And the thing is that sometimes it can be that only one task is remaining and then there's, there's, there, there's a team member who you know, who should be taking care of that. We cannot tolerate that things don't get completed. No burndown chart. Burndown charts are going to take some practice. Your estimation will improve over time. Reluctant estimation. People are a little bit hesitant because they fear that they're going to be called out on it and it will be held against them. But it's all about building trust. Too short. People don't spend enough time on sprint planning. People think that they can determine the next two weeks' work in a half an hour meeting. 
Now, let me tell you this. Personally, I hate meetings. I think as a rule, a meeting should never be longer than 30 minutes because it will help you to be driven and focused. However, in this case, sprint planning could easily take an hour. Maybe in the beginning, it might take a little bit longer because it's a new process. But you have to take your time. If you don't plan well, then the whole agile process becomes a joke because you don't deliver, you don't meet expectations, it's a farce. And then finally, you know, risks and issues get ignored. You start planning, a, you start planning ahead, but people are totally oblivious of risks that they know are coming or that they have identified. Then three more things. So there's, there's no backlog grooming. Nobody has looked whether the requirements have gotten a new priority. So it's important to make sure that whoever interacts with the customer keeps the team informed, you know, keeps the product backlog up to date. Then people missing. Let's say, for example, there's a bank holiday whereby the entire team or a good number of people will be absent because a bank holiday takes place in one country but not the other. You might want to consider to postpone the meeting, the, the planning meeting for a day just to make sure that we have everybody involved and we can be very effective in planning everything. And then limited participation, some people just don't speak out. Well, you know what? The Scrum Master needs to do his role. And the Scrum Master needs to make sure that they get involved. And he needs to call them out. He needs to say, hey, what do you think? I want to hear your opinion. They might feel uncomfortable in the beginning to, to be called out. But at the same time, on the long run, they will feel that at least they have a voice and they don't have to get irritated by always the same people, you know, saying the same thing. Okay, the daily stand-up meetings. There's no excuse to have a daily stand-up meeting longer than 15 minutes. We have to drive through this. If you want to keep people motivated to be at these daily stand-up meetings, then let's get it done and over with. Okay? Discussions. Now, this is a very important element. It always, always happens. Someone mentions something and it's a problem he, he's having and the whole team or a part, of, a part of the team starts having a discussion. Inevitably, the whole 15-minute thing is going to be ruined. And what the Scrum Master needs to do is to say, okay, let me take a note of that. And he literally writes it down, right? And he writes down all the different points that possibly are up for discussion. And then after the, the 15 minutes of the daily standard meeting, then he, he calls out the different people and say like, hey, you know what, let's, let's talk about this. Because don't forget, frequently, these discussions only affect the number of people. We do not want to hold up anyone being stuck at a meeting where they have no interest in, in being at. Let's stick to the business and let's keep the daily standard meeting really for what it is. Blockers are not mentioned. Make sure people call out the blockers. Or if they don't have a blocker, they should say, I have no blockers, I'm good to go. People don't pay attention. If you always do the same rotation and, you, and a person knows he comes last, he will not pay attention for all the other people. Well, the Scrum Master can rotate and he can call out at random who should speak, making sure though that every single person gets, uh, gets to speak. And then people look at their laptop. Well, have people stand up. Force people away from their laptop. There's a good reason why it's called a standard meeting. is because nobody wants to stand up for too long and it pulls you away out of your comfort zone where you're at right now. Now, no visualization. We have to have a scrum board. We need to follow what is there. Late arrivals. People will keep arriving late. It always happens. But you know what? No excuses. You start the meeting on time. If you start a meeting on time and there's someone systematically who comes always late, it's an embarrassing thing to come late. And you do it once, you do it twice, but what you will see is that the team gets annoyed by it after a while and the group will, will tell the, the person who's always late, you know, you need to get here on time. And it tends to correct itself naturally. It's very important to realize with these daily standard meetings, the Scrum Master role is very important. And he is not the boss. He's the facilitator. He's there to help things to go smoothly, to move forward, and to make sure everybody gets heard. Now, recipe for a successful stand-up. People should come prepared. There's nobody who should come to your daily standard meeting and say, like, um, uh, I don't know. No. 
you should set the expectation that you expect when they come that they know what they're going to talk about. Also, make sure that people all talk about all three questions. I've mentioned before that very frequently people forget to mention the blockers. So call it out. Then have people come on time. Then be about being specific. Here's an example of what it should sound like. Well, yesterday I was working on task one, two, three. It was sized eight hours. And I spent the whole day on it, about six hours, and I have X amount of hours left. This is how it should sound, because that way the team will fully understand how far we are with it. Then, the fifth one is avoid sounding busy. People, the honest truth is people like to sound busy. And if they don't have much to report, they're going to mention extra stuff that are that is trivial. If people don't have much to report, that's okay. The Scrum Master should point out that we need to address the real issues and the topics. And so it's not a time to solve problems. Now the extra mile here, okay? You can add prestige to your own daily standard meetings. For managers, it is incredibly awesome to attend every so often. As an Agile coach, I don't expect the manager to be there for the entire 15 minutes. Even if the if the manager would come in, let's say, halfway, and he spends five, six minutes there just by showing himself and showing interest, the team will realize, well, this is a very important part of our process. They also will think, I need to be well prepared and need to make sure that what I, whatever I say makes perfect sense. Now, with executives... When a team reaches a certain very important milestone and there was huge expectation from, you know, executive management, I guarantee you that executives will show the willingness to go to the team and and be present for five minutes to express his gratitude because it will motivate the team and will keep them going and will make sure that, that they're better united and more geared towards getting the results. And recognition plaques. Honestly, if a major milestone is, is reached, you can order a recognition plaque and you can hang it up in the room if the team is co-located as a badge of honor. It is a great thing, for example, for an executive to come down and to hand over a certification. Okay, review meetings. So the sprint review meetings, you know, always the same people speaking out. By the way, long weekends. So be careful. When you schedule things, make sure, try to avoid Fridays and try to avoid Mondays. Sometimes it can't be avoided. But the thing is that people tend to take long weekends and they take off an extra Friday or an extra Monday. And the problem then is if you have a crucial meeting planned, such as a sprint review, well then multiple people could, for example, be absent. So if you schedule these, for example, let's say on a Tuesday, right? Right before the the actual sprint starts, you could avoid problems like this. Okay, then a retrospective. Retrospectives help people and they're finally able to vent and talk about the, their frustrations or their difficulties and how they would like to see something changed. But at the same time, then they say like, well, I'm, I'm too busy and I can't do it. Also, important, make a record of all the, the recommendations that people have have made and send them out afterwards because sometimes someone cannot make it and it would be great to send them out. And also, you can keep the either the previous retrospective for the next retrospective and you can reflect back with the team on it like, well, here's what we discussed last time. Let's go over to the next one. Okay, agile transformation. And these are the last few slides. Here's some common problems. The usual suspects. Some people always get called out as the bad guy and so on. The Scrum Master should really be impartial and try to take stand up for everybody and unify the team as a whole. Now, open air, I'm sure that this daily standard meeting was probably a very successful standard meeting. There's one thing missing. There's no visualization. They're just talking up up loud. I can tell you that the team needs to be geared towards something because otherwise it is very hard to pay attention. Unrealistic. People just say... People say that everything's fine and so on. Now we all know this is not the case. Then old school. If we ask the team members for estimates, we have to, you know, be honest with ourselves. People are hesitant to give estimates because they're afraid they will be called out on it. Well, if that's the case, let's not call them out on it. 
and let's make it part of an of an open communication whereby we we're understanding and we're willing to you know to to work with it don't make too long of meetings and in sterile environments you know offices should be something that is is really a workplace so focus that's what i said about the the meeting boards and so on every minute counts make everybody a big part of it let the meeting come to you to the team rather than the team going to meeting rooms keep everything together here's a little overview of how walls at your office can really turn into a fantastic workspace where everything is visible at any time and any point in time and the agile process implementation here are the different steps that I personally would recommend by how to implement Agile to implement it into a company or a department or division. Okay. A committee needs to be established. You need to identify the specific problems. Then make sure you provide some agile training to different roles. And then you can sl slowly start going over the different, the different elements and the reporting at the very end. You can't report if you have not anything else up. These are higher level things. One of the things, for example, is new hires. If in the future we do hiring, let's make sure that people have already some experience with it. Root cause analysis. Let's go back every quarter to make sure that, that we revisit and look at the problems. Final remarks. I think I'm, I reached the end. There was another video I was going to show, but maybe I'll leave it up to your discretion. Thank you, Martin. Now, let's look at a company that has embraced the Agile methodology. We are the world's number one largest tax preparation provider. We keep busy all year round, and the key part of that is the development and the strategy. Having the Scrum methodology has been really helpful as we continue to serve our clients year round. At the Brain Trust Consulting Group, we've found two main reasons teams fail. One is they have no process and they end up in chaos, or two, they have too much process and they're mired in it. We've got a pretty tight cycle, so tax season comes around once a year. We're trying to pump a lot of products to the market. Scrum is not a good fit for every organization. It was a good fit for H&R Block and they were willing to implement it. It had great executive support throughout the organization. We used uh, Brain Trust as a change agent within our uh, initiative at H&R Block. Providing constructive feedback to the team that was usable and we could turn around and, and implement the next day. There's what's in the books and there's what you need to do to really get the product out the door and work in our environment. It's not easy to implement Agile. It's easy to attend a class and it's easy to come away fired up with all of the ideas. Where both their training and their coaching helped, you know, it, it just integrated so well and I think it just feeds one into the other. And the coaching side is really the practical application of what people have learned in the classroom environment into their specific working environment. So it's all about finding out their pain points and how to apply a particular technique inside their environment to be most successful with. What I've seen of Brain Trust has been great, and I know that our IT partners have been um, very pleased with them. It was actually great to have an outside perspective and had seen some of the pitfalls or some of the behaviors that might have historically derailed Scrum at places. Our goal is to help the team be successful, to help the individual be as successful as they can be. The coaching, is, it, I think, has been invaluable. I don't think we'd be anywhere near successful without it. Terrific to have Brain Trust in our early part of the journey for us, the change to Agile and Scrum.